is being recorded. Um, so I guess first I'd just like to welcome everyone to our Renewable Energy Task Group meeting of the ECAC. We're really excited and thankful that you all were willing to help us out with this process and join us. Um, Sean, I'm just gonna check who that is, sorry. Oh, it's River. I'm just letting River into the room to be with us here. Sorry, so i um, glad you could all join us and be part of this process. Um, first, I wanna say that my name is Stephanie Ciccarello and I'm the Energy and Sustainability Coordinator for the Town of Amherst and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And we would ask that the first time each of you speak this, this evening that you say your name and then also state your pronouns and then you can continue to comment or whatever it is you want to do to participate. Um, so um, I just wanted to let everyone know that this process is going to be very different than we, the town had a climate action plan that it developed in 2005 and it was very different. It was a very small group. It did not involve the broader community. So this is an extremely different process than what we've done before and we're very excited for this process and so happy to have so many voices from the community participate. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say a few housekeeping things. One of them is that if for some reason this meeting gets Zoom bombed where someone comes on and disrupts the meeting by either using inappropriate language or showing offensive imagery, please feel free to just disconnect from the meeting immediately. Just log off and leave the meeting and we will contact you with further instruction as to how we're going to reconvene. Uh, the other thing I wanted to state is that if you're not talking, the best thing to do is to mute your microphone because sometimes background noise gets picked up even more so from those of us listening than what you may be hearing. Um, I unfortunately was on a meeting this morning and inadvertently talked about my puppy's pooping habits <laughs> and didn't realize my microphone was on. So, you know, it happens. <laughs> so try to remember to mute your microphone. Um, and uh, the other thing is if your video at any point says that you have an unstable connection um, or you have an unstable internet connection, just feel free to turn your video off. We would love it if you could stay on for as much as possible during this meeting so that we can really see one another. Um, but if you have to turn off your video connection because of an unstable connection, that's totally fine. So feel free to do so. So I'm gonna start this meeting um, if you bear with me one second with a land acknowledgement. So this is to the indigenous people of the land that were here before us. So we humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonotuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west and the Abenaki to the north. And with that, I would like to turn the meeting over to Gazi Kaya. Thanks so much, Stephanie. <clears throat> I'm Gazi Kaya. I use they, them pronouns. And my first name is, is two words. So Gazi Kaya is my first name. Um, and in group activities like these, it can be really helpful to make agreements about ways that we would like to be respectful of one another. So I'm going to introduce some possible agreements that we can start with for today. And then as we get to know each other over the next couple of meetings, we may find ones that we want to add or things we want to change. Um, so the first one is that we want to be um, putting people and relationships first. So we want to think about how these climate issues affect real people in um, very tangible ways in their lives and think about building um, understanding rather than winning or getting our individual goals met. Um, as a part of taking uh, care of each other, we encourage you to just take care of yourselves by taking a break whenever you might need to if you want to um, use the restroom or turn your video off for a moment to talk with your children or your dog or whoever else is needing some attention. Um, if you need to go get a snack or some water, please just feel free to do that at any moment. Um, 
The second one is to think about the language that you use. Um, in some of the other groups, we have interpretation into different languages. We're not going to have that in this group. But even so, we're really going to ask um, each other to slow down, um, to speak slowly and clearly, to really think about avoiding jargon or any technical terms. Um, and to pause frequently and check for questions. Uh, one of the ways that we're going to be inserting a pause to help us all be really thoughtful tonight, since we don't have translation, which naturally creates that, is that we're gonna ask you to raise your hand before you speak. Um, and we'll, we'll see your hand and we'll wait a good 10, 20 seconds before we um, go ahead and call on you. Um, you can do that by just physically raising your hand if you have the video on. Um, you can press it uh, on your little, um, if you click participants, you'll see your name um, under a panelist and you can raise a hand there by clicking on more. Uh, if you're on the phone, you can also press star nine and that'll raise your hand. So that's just going to help us to be really thoughtful and reflective as we go through and to avoid what can sometimes turn into a competitive conversation and can kind of quiet those voices who, who don't have the, um, the, the personality or the style or the knowledge to jump in quite so quickly. Um, that moves into the next one, which is step up, step back. Um, if you tend to be a quiet person, um, or if you tend to be a person who really shares a lot in meetings, we wanna ask you um, to sort of shift on that. So if you're a quieter person, we encourage you to think about sharing more. If you tend to talk a lot, think about sharing a little less. Um, and this is to encourage us to all participate and to even allow for what can sometimes feel like an uncomfortable silence in those longer pauses. Some people who are quieter or more hesitant may, um, work up the, uh, the ability to jump in. So we wanna leave some pauses. And we're gonna um, also ask you to really keep things private and don't pry for more information. So we're gonna hopefully be sharing some real information with each other about how these issues impact our lives. Um, so whatever you learn about others, their families, their feelings, and their finances, please keep all of that confidential and don't ask for more personal details or stories. Um, let's really try to receive any need without asking for someone to prove it. Um, and the last one is that we're gonna really uh, make an uh, effort to learn about each other's personal and cultural values, remembering that culture and values are just um, filtered through our own experiences. What might be right or good or normal for you might not be um, the same for everyone. So one of the ways that we're gonna do that, like Stephanie mentioned, is we're gonna introduce ourselves with our pronouns. We're gonna really encourage you to stick to talking about just your own personal experiences and not talk about other people or other groups. Uh, to commit to considering, um, again, that your version of right may not be the same as everyone else's in the room. Um, and the way that we can learn the best is by asking lots of questions. So that's it for the agreement. Thanks a lot, Gazikaya. I'm Jim Newman. Uh, my, I'm comfortable using he, him, his pronouns, uh, and I uh, am part of the consultant team that has helped set up this process. Um, but our role is really to just make sure that everything goes smoothly. We don't have a big role to play. Uh, so in that sense, let me introduce uh, Andra and Dwayne as the co-chairs of this uh, this committee and members of the uh, Energy and Climate Action Committee for the Town of Amherst. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. As Stephanie said, um, it's uh, it's really a wonderful thing for us to have, you know, the community members with all different experience to be a part of 
um, our planning for how Amherst is going to um, be as green as possible. Um, and this particular group is focused on renewables and uh, electricity and something I'll explain called um, community choice aggregation. Um, so, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, so I'm a member of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, which is a town committee. Duane and I are both volunteers um, on the committee and um, we're helped very much by Stephanie who works for town. And then there's also some town counselors. So we have some um, folks who are elected officials as well. The um, ECAC, which is how we tend to um, shorten it, is um, not a decision-making body, but we're planners or, you know, suggestors for the town council, the elected officials who make the decisions. Um, and we did do some um, suggesting already. If you saw the introductory uh, recording that we made, um, I um, described our, our uh, process for getting input and, and then um, suggesting goals for um, our, our town's climate goals. And the town council took our advice and set the goals of reaching net zero um, by a greenhouse gas by um, 2050, which is what the science says we need to do. And then, you know, stepping back by 2030, just 10 years from now, we want to be halfway there. And then if we step back another five years, um, we'd like to be a quarter the way there. So making this climate plan is really about thinking about how the, the energy we use um, can be less polluting um, and have less carbon, um, less greenhouse gases. And your help in um, making priorities about what ways we might do this is, um, is what this task group is really about. Um, and it's very important to us that we're involving a lot of people from um, different parts of town who do different kinds of things in town and know different parts of the community in town. Um, and we will be reaching out to and already started reaching out to businesses and to um, uh, residents and to other committees. And, um, you know, this is a part of the work that the ECAC is, is doing. Um, and uh, the town manager will be, um, you know, sort of Stephanie's boss um, will be, involved in, in getting town departments um, to respond to questions we have. So that is um, what we're gonna be doing together. Um, so this community choice aggregation, we decided that it needs a longer introduction than anything I could give right now. Um, and so we'll probably make a recording that you can watch at any time um, so that you can understand some of the um, background. But the basic idea of community choice aggregation is that the community, the, you know, a local uh, community makes the decisions about um, where our electricity comes from. And um, we're working already with Pelham and Northampton to 
create this um, organization that will buy electricity for all of us, our residents, our businesses, our, um, our governments, and, um, and then in the process, there's money. <laughs> the, the, we buy the electricity, we sell the electricity, and then there's some money left over that we get to choose. That's the choice part of community choice aggregation. We get to choose how we spend that. And, and the, we can keep more of the energy dollars that we spend local um, to create maybe energy efficiency jobs um, to um, support uh, solar in our town. Um, so that's um, and the aggregation part is the pool, pooling all of our um, electricity use together. So that's community choice aggregation, CCA, and we'll get more into that, but it provides a tool for us to um, be able to do some of the ideas we're going to come up with and provide some money to put towards it um, while also giving us choices. So, Dwayne. Great. Thanks, Andra. Andra. And um, uh, thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. I've had the pleasure to uh, um, be um, a uh, member of the um, Energy and Climate Action Committee for the Town of Amherst. Uh, working with Andre and, and Stephanie on that and our consultants and, and wanted to um, um, support Andre's um, appreciation for you all being part of this uh, task group uh, that's really uh, geared to um, make sure, as Stephanie points out, that this is a community-driven and community-informed uh, process. Uh, and so we do want to really use the time that we have together uh, Andre and I will set the stage just quickly here, but to really get um, some really in engagement with community members uh, and, and really appreciate your time. Um, the other important thing to recognize is that um, while we are eagerly um, uh, working on developing our climate action plan uh, over the course of the next number of, of uh, months, <clears throat> uh, th this work does not stop at, at uh, Developing the plan that's in essence the beginning <clears throat> of the plan of the of the uh, uh, of the uh, process uh, that we have in front of us um, and it will be important that the community is not only involved in developing helping us to develop the plan uh, and, uh, and making sure the plan is informed by the the community uh, but also when it comes time to uh, supporting and implementing and helping to make decisions uh, many many difficult decisions, I would uh, suggest, um, once the plan is, uh, is enacted and, and in, in force. So we look forward to not only your engagement <clears throat> and your uh, other members of the community as well, uh, engagement uh, not only in this um, working group as we work towards the plan, but also well beyond the plan as well. Uh, so I wanted to use my seven minutes, I think, or maybe five minutes left to just put a little bit of context of, uh, of where, we, where we're at in Amherst and sort of frame a little bit about the challenge and the opportunity uh, that is in front of us. Um, and this uh, task force is really focused on um, uh, renewable energy and particularly uh, electricity generation uh, that will be central to the plan with regard to meeting the carbon mitigation um, requirements. Uh, that the town has set forward. Uh, and so it's important to sort of at least have some context of, of um, what our, what our um, current use of uh, electricity is uh, in the town, as well as uh, where some of our, and what some of our so, um, renewable energy resources are uh, and choices ahead of, uh, ahead of us. And, and I would argue some difficult choices, uh, but ones that really need to be informed by community um, preferences uh, and community en engagement. So I don't wanna throw a whole lot of numbers out, but I'll throw just a few out and then put them in context. Um, currently in Amherst, uh, if you uh, exclude the colleges and the universities and the university, uh, we as a community, uh, and this is primarily residential um, and, some, and commercial, we really don't have any substantial industry 
um, in town, uh, but it also includes municipal use. Um, we consume about 100,000 megawatt hours of electricity in a year. Uh, that's probably a number that's, it's a nice round number. Uh, it's estimated, it doesn't mean a lot, uh, but um, I'll put that in context in a moment, but just think, think about that in terms of the uh, challenge in front of us is, uh, is really looking at, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily replacing 100,000 megawatt hours a year with renewable energy, because a percentage of that is already renewable uh, based on um, state policies and so forth, but uh, most of it is not renewable. Um, in, um, in terms of what the renewable energy electricity generating uh, resources are that we have to, to work with, uh, primarily in, in Massachusetts, we're talking about solar, uh, we're talking about wind uh, onshore, which is actually fairly limited, uh, but very abundant in um, offshore wind, uh, as well as hydro, uh, both small hydro as well as uh, large, um, large scale hydro imported from uh, primarily from Canada. When you look at Amherst itself, uh, we are in the Pioneer Valley, so we really don't have uh, wind resources you would expect uh, to be economically viable. Uh, so we're really uh, focused primarily on solar as, as uh, renewable energy generation, local renewable energy generation opportunities um, uh, for, for the town. Um, so when I mentioned that we consume about 100,000 megawatt hours a year, if, for example, and this is just a scenario, uh, if we were to, to uh, meet all of that consumption with solar, we would need to um, find um, room for about 90 megawatts of capacity uh, in, Massachusetts, in, in, in Amherst. Uh, that number may mean something to some people, it may not to others. Uh, so put another way, that 90 megawatts would typically take up about one square mile um, of, of area. Uh, it doesn't need to be all in land. Um, obviously, we have roofs, uh, we have residential roofs, we have commercial roofs, um, and we have uh, parking lots uh, and, and so forth. We have schools, uh, school roofs and so forth. Uh, but if it was, you know, thinking about it in terms of land area, it'd be about one square mile. To put that in context, uh, the town of Amherst is about 27 square miles. Uh, so it would be dedicating, um, uh, you know, one could think about it about, you know, chunking off about 5%, maybe less than 5% of Amherst uh, for our uh, renewable energy generation. Not, that's not the way we're looking at it, but just to put it in, into context. Um, as I mentioned, uh, particularly for solar, uh, we do have opportunities uh, in town. Uh, we've already seen uh, solar in town uh, on, on roofs, um, on parking lot canopies at the university, uh, certainly. Um, and, um, but we also have um, uh, opportunities uh, on our land, on our landfill, which is moving forward, as you know, as, as people probably know. Um, and uh, but we also have forests, uh, and we have agricultural land, and we have open land, and that's um, where uh, tough decisions may come into play as we move forward with regard to uh, to what extent uh, do we enable and uh, allow uh, solar to encroach on some of these other lands, which have um, other valuable uh, aspects to them um, if we are trying to meet some of these, uh, some of this generation locally. Those are decisions and, and discussions to be had later, but just throwing them out there as, uh, as um, uh, sort of the things that we are starting to confront as we talk about going to close to 100% renewables. Uh, so really the community, and, and we're looking for engagement from the community on some of these issues in terms of um, uh, how to consider some of these trade-offs of, of where we get our renewable energy from, uh, trade-offs uh, uh, with regard to land use uh, for solar uh, within Amherst or even outside of Amherst. Uh, how much do we want to depend strictly on getting our renewable energy locally uh, versus, uh, for example, from offshore wind, uh, which is going to be uh, quite abundant and, and a growing resource for the Commonwealth in the next uh, decade and two. Um, and, uh, um, and so really what is our openness to uh, really contract for some of this renewable energy outside of Amherst, either through the CCA, the Community Choice Aggregation that Andra uh, put forward, and how much uh, do we want to put into investment and opportunity to site um, and, uh, and support and gain some economic advantage from siting renewable energy uh, within, our, within our town 
uh, but at the same time, then some of the trade-offs come forward with regard to land use. So those are the issues that uh, we start um, grappling with. Um, I, would al I also did wanna say that uh, when I say the town currently uses 100,000 megawatt hours of, a year for electricity, the expectation is that for that to grow and grow probably substantially, um, not because we're becoming less energy efficient, uh, we're, we're working, the, we're work, we need to work on that as well, and that'll be part of the, is part of the plan as well. Uh, but we're really looking to, um, uh, to, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel. A key strategy is to electrify our heating sector in, with uh, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps for buildings. And then um, also on the transportation side, a key strategy um, for the town uh, and for the Commonwealth is really to electrify our vehicles as well. Um, and so that really is gonna grow, expect to grow our demand uh, and consumption for electricity. So we, um, to, to, to that extent, uh, some of the, these issues will be even more pronounced uh, and opportunities will be uh, more, uh, greater opportunities for local um, generation. So, um, uh, that's sort of my take on it. And sorry, I did uh, mean to say that uh, my, my pro preferred pronouns are his and his and uh, he, um, and sorry to uh, not mention that at the beginning. So I'll pass it back to uh, Jim, I guess. Zikaya. Jim, Zikaya. I was wondering if we could all just take a deep breath for a minute. That was a ton of information. And I know that we have a lot of levels of understanding in this group and that for some of us that information was not something we could wrap our heads around including myself um, so I want to reassure um, everyone that um, in addition to these meetings myself and Andra and Dwayne and Stephanie are available to talk at a slower pace with opportunities for more questions um, outside of this meeting that uh, Andra mentioned, we're going to hopefully put together um, a video that will be a short uh, but very clear uh, introduction to some of these things that Andra and Dwayne talked about quickly tonight. Um, and that everything that Duane went through, these are sort of the priorities about, you know, what, what are the big chunks that need to be tackled. Um, and all of those decisions have not firmly been made. So what we're doing together is to really try and understand what some of the options are and how they'll impact us all. Um, so I, I thought that, that little note about one mile of square footage was really interesting and helpful for me to picture sort of like how many do we need and i think it's interesting that we actually know how many solar pa panels could replace you're saying that could replace like regular electricity that burns some sort of fuel that creates pollution in an oversimplified manner <laughs> Yep, yep, uh, pretty much. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to, again, take a moment. Just give it a minute. So thanks. Uh, Duane and Andra, thanks a ton. A great introduction. Uh, the committee has been working very hard. And you now get to work very hard to uh, figure out what we're doing. What is this plan? Uh, so to start, uh, I'm gonna ask some questions uh, to get us going. So when we talk about all this energy and all this stuff that is you know, some of it's being made by burning gas and some of it's being made by burning other things and some of it's being made by solar power and some of it, all these different places. Some of it comes from, uh, you know, Quebec and, uh, and big dams. Uh, um, 
a lot of that energy gets used wherever you live. And so our first question to get the conversation kind of rolling is to ask the question of um, how is your home heated and cooled? Do you burn gas? Is it electric? Is it cooled? Uh, is it cooled by opening the windows? Um, and who controls that? Who controls how that happens? Uh, is it something that you control? Is it someone that someone else controls? And then finally, how could that be better? How could you make that better? Or how could someone make it better? What would be better? So we'll give that a sec. And then I'll open that question up to answer. And feel free to wave your hand or raise your hand if you want to, uh, you want to speak. Aline. Hi, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Alini, um, and I go by she, her, hers. So I live at the Brooks, and I rent um, the condominium here. And what I I feel like the whatever system that we have, we, we, it is electric, first of all. Um, so we have the ACs, and it's extremely old, in my opinion. Um, and I feel like tons we waste way more on energy um, because the systems are not really updated and the same with the heating. And I, you know, during the winter, I can feel the drafts in the windows. I can feel the draft on the doors. And I have asked my landlord to look into whatever we could do to improve that because at the end of the day, I am paying for the electricity. And then in the summer, it's around $200. And then, in the winter, anywhere up to 400 a month that we're paying. And it's a two bedroom, two floors um, condo. So I, I, I feel like she kind of threw the ball back at me and said, that's on you um, because whatever, <laughs> like she, she's out of town. So, and I know because my mom owns the apartment here and they had uh, whoever the company that we have our um, that we have our source from, they went to their house and they like changed the bulbs, changed the 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 outlets or whatever to make it more um, cost friendly. And then when I asked her about that, she's like, "I haven't heard of that," and kind of left it up to me to go figure that out. And of course, because I'm busy with the kids and work and all of the other uh, stuff going on. I never really looked into it. And then I always suffer at the end, um, not at the end, at the end of every month, I guess. Um, but yes, I think that a lot could be done better. And I don't know if it's the responsibility of the condominium or if it's really the responsibility of the condo to have a better system for our electricity, um, heating and cooling systems. So that's kind of how I feel about mine. <laughs> Thanks a ton, Lily. You're welcome. Uh, awesome. uh, I'm going to let that sit for a moment. Just, mm -hmm. just hold and sort of think about that experience. Mm -hmm. Jen, would you like to jump in? Sure. You hear me? Yeah, great. So I also live at the Brook. Um, and so we own our unit, but that doesn't change a whole lot for us in terms of heating and cooling. Um, all electric, we're an end unit too. So we end up, and it's like pretty poorly insulated. So we end up paying a lot more than um, the units that are, you know, inside uh, between two. Um, so we have control of the heat, you know, and the cooling, I guess, but we, um, and we have some control over like the suppliers, I guess, like, so we could opt for 
green um, or clean energy, but it's significantly more expensive. And I, I personally like haven't like compared to what my husband has and he's like, you can't do it. Like, so um, I, you know, as an owner, I don't feel like we have a lot, I don't have any more control than really a renter. Um, and, you know, I guess it could be made better if, um, you know, clean energy, you know, if were more affordable, it was more on par with dirty energy. <laughs> And um, the other thing that, you know, I've had some conversations about or just like the idea of incentivizing, um, you know, it's just solar is something that, you know, I, I, I walk a lot in the neighborhood and look longingly at all the people with solar panels and it's like not, you know, achievable um, under our circumstances. And, you know, just the, if like what really stops, like it's always like what really stops that from happening and it's like always the resounding question for me. And yeah, the idea of incentivizing that you know via so classic management owns this um property and other properties and just you know there are a good number of is you know we're not the only ones you know there are a good number of uh, apartments uh in amherst and um i think that everyone would probably <laughs> love to be able to uh participate more fully in that so thanks jen that's Hold for a sec. We can come back if you won't have more. You can always add more. Um, a, an interesting, there's an interesting sort of observation for me in this so far. One of the big topics in the sort of renewable field is what's called uh, uh, the, well, essentially, which is making heating and cooling electric as opposed to being gas fired. But you note that everybody who's spoken is talking about electric heating and cooling. So in that world, these guys have already, they're already past that particular solution. Um, any other, uh, who, who would like uh, to join this? Yeah, go ahead, Jen. Sorry, there was something else I wanted to add because Alini uh, reminded right. me that, you know, Mass Saves came and did, you know, the audit that they do and, you know, but, and we could change light bulbs and, you know, outlets and whatever, but, you know, when it comes down to like, improving the installation, that's not an option because we are like, even owners, it's just like studs in as they say. So we can't go into the walls and improve the insulation situation. And again, we lose a ton of money. I mean, there's just so much um, air going out of here. And so that's another thing I just wanted to stick in there. Yeah, thanks, Jen. That's a key, key observation. Um, Thanks a lot. Is it Kaya? So um, I didn't realize that I had done this, but I put all three of us who live at the brook together in this group. <laughs> so you're going to hear a lot about the brook. Um, we have one more community leader who's um, going to be joining us hopefully at some point tonight, but if not tonight, tonight eventually, who's lived in other complexes. And um, I personally have lived in five complexes in Amherst. So um, I would just echo the things that both Alini and Jen said. I think that um, as renters or in a community that's a complex that is run by some sort of property manager, the, the choices just become minuscule. And 40% um, of Amherst is renters. Uh, and 20% of Amherst residents are um, live below the poverty level. And 91% of those people rent. So just to like wrap your head around of who are the renters, a lot of people think it's just students, 
uh, but it's really, it's really not. It's a ton of families, um, families with full-time jobs and multiple kids who still are um, living below the poverty level and who, uh, like in my situation, I qualify for fuel assistance, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and it does significantly impact my finances. But when I tried to get involved with um, a community solar program, because I, I really care about this stuff, um, I signed up through something called Nexamp. I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but it did not like uh, work with my fuel assistance. They haven't created a program that acknowledges that. So it got very confusing for me and it has been like a huge financial burden to me this year uh, because basically the way their system works is you pay Nexamp for the solar and then they pay Eversource and fuel assistance pays Eversource. So both of the monies are going to Eversource and then I was basically, I wouldn't have had to pay any electric bill for the past six months, but instead I was paying like, usually my electric bill is very low because I'm super frugal and I like keep everything off all the time and freezing. And usually I only get like $87 bills and um, I've been paying like 250 to this next amp for six months. And after the first month, I tried to cancel and they agreed to let me cancel, but it's taken six months for Eversource to take me off their list. So it keeps charging me every month. And I've asked Nexamp, you know, many times that they need to get a committee together and acknowledge that they're marketing to our neighborhood. That's how I found out about it. I got a postcard here. But they're, if they don't have a program that works with fuel assistance, then they're going to put a lot of people like me in a really bad situation that I can't seem to get out of. Um, and they keep telling me, oh, your credits will stay there. I'm like, I don't need credits. I need to not pay you money that I wouldn't have had to pay, um, especially in the middle of what's like a financial crisis for me anyways. So for me, I you know, I sort of always had the feeling that environmentalism is just for rich people and I wasn't going to even bother. And then I've tried really hard this year to do things and it feels like everything has ended up being a catastrophe. Like the solar panel thing was horrible. You know, I tried to like buy local food for a little while. It was like $14,000 million. So everything I try, you know, it's like, um, there's just no system for people with limited income or who are renters to be able to participate. I'm really happy that Lynn is here because I've learned a little bit about co-op power and I know that's something that they really like to talk about. So I hope at some point tonight you'd be willing to share, but um, yeah. And same thing about the insulation that you can just feel the heat just like going right through the walls. <laughs> Thanks. Someone else like to jump in, talk about your own experience? Lynn, don't forget to unmute yourself. That works better that way, doesn't it? Well, you, I mean, it's um, lovely to watch you. <laughs> the, um, uh, I lived five years in North Village and another two years in Puffton um, after that. It was quite a number of years ago, but these stories are sounding so very familiar. Um, um, to answer answer the question you posed, Jim, um, you know, we I live in a, a house um, up in Franklin County now, and we heat with oil, uh, and we um, tried for a bunch of years to get as high a percentage of biodiesel into our 
uh, oil heat system, but uh, found it was hard to get. Hopefully with the biodiesel plant coming in in Greenfield, we'll be able to get it again because um, that felt good. And we also noticed there was so much less soot in our basement um, using the biodiesel. So we figured there was probably less soot in our lungs too. But, and lives with us. And generally, house just closing and the shades um, and then opening them up and getting the fans and blowing in all the cool air at night. Hopefully, cool air at night. Usually, it works. Um, my mom, 87 needs more sometimes so we have a small window air conditioner that she uses and um, and that's fueled by electricity and so we have um, the co-op power version of the next amp the subscription solar program and we get 15 percent off of our electric bill um, but it's uh, as someone who administers that program it's it's really it doesn't work well with um, uh, with folks who are on fuel assistance who have the reduced electric rate and um, we've run into that and just we just haven't charged people like you know we have like two people that got into that situation and we said stop paying us and pay us when you get to use those credits even if it's next year sometime you know um but it it was it was really heartbreaking to watch how the, the mismatch happened there um, and in the future, I really, um, there's, there's a, a, one of the members of Co-op Power who's um, approaching 100 said to me five years ago, she said, I want 100% biodiesel in my oil heat system. Now I want to be off fossil fuels. And I said, yeah, in a couple of years, we're probably, she said, how many years do you think I got left? I want to be off fossil fuels before I die. And we're like, okay, okay, I got the message. Let's see what we could do. And I'm feeling that way. I just like, I want. I want not only me, but I want my whole community, I want our whole region off of fossil fuels yesterday. And it feels urgent and, um, and to do it in an equitable way um, so that it's not just household by household, but it's community by community that we figure out how everybody can um, get off of fossil fuels and have an affordable way to have a secure energy supply. And I'm really applaud what you're doing what we're doing here in Amherst, because this feels really important. While we pause, I just want to welcome Cedric. I'm so glad that you're here, Cedric. And um, hey, uh, just want to fill you in. We're talking right now about uh, how do you heat and cool where you live? And um, who's in control of it and what would what would make it better. So if you want to jump in uh, at any point and share thoughts on that, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to think about that for a second and let someone uh, someone else answer if they have an answer. Sounds great. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry about no, no. Later. Thanks for joining. Thank you, everybody. Would someone else like to? Oh, sorry, Jake. Didn't see your hand. Go for it. Hi, my name is Jake Marley. My pronouns are he, his, and him. Um, and to answer your question, Jim, um, I live in Belchertown, Mass., so just outside of Amherst. I live at home. Uh, my family bought into a community shared solar project um, a number of years ago, so able to take advantage or make use of that. Um, I am in a separate apartment, though, um, and my space is heated by oil, so, and I have direct control over changing that, um, and after this conversation, I'm feeling motivated to do so. Um, in thinking about ways how I can cut down um, or be better myself. Um, recently, I've really been trying to eliminate single-use plastics um, just entirely. And so with that is thinking a lot about planning ahead. Of course, that's separate from renewable energy, but conservation or um, limiting impact uh, type 
Um, and then limiting trips as well, uh, planning ahead. So um, unplugging appliances is something that I'm constantly doing, uh, reducing energy usage. Um, I do have a single unit AC that I've had to turn on a few, few nights recently. Um, but yes, try to open up the windows, uh, make use of the natural landscape. In my background, um, I'm the manager of a company, Hyperion Systems, which is uh, a local uh, solar development company and also involved in a lot of research. Uh, work with Dwayne and River uh, and the team at UMass Clean Energy Extension. And our company is primarily focused on um, solar on farmland or agrovoltaics or dual use solar, which I can explain more about uh, at another time. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. You know, um, it would be great if you could talk a sec about your family's uh, community solar. Like, what does that mean? What's that? So my um, community solar, it's a larger scale project rather than having it on the roof of your or in the backyard of your property. Um, for various reasons, uh, we have a lot of trees around, so it's not an ideal roof uh, situation. Um, so we bought, my parents bought into a uh, large scale community project that is in Massachusetts. Um, it's in Harvard, Mass. I'm not sure of the overall size, um, but it was installed by a Massachusetts company designed by a Massachusetts company, Solar Design Associates. Um, and so, so it's uh, pooling investors, essentially taking several homeowners um, to raise capital, to buy into a project um, similar to co-op power, I, I would think. Or, or in some sense. Um, and then they, they, through the utility, get the money back um, to, off of their bill. Um, it, it's credits uh, to their monthly bill, which it sounds like um, would be very beneficial to, to everyone, of course. Great, thank, thank you, Jake. Um, just as, you know, we, we use all these terms and say all these things and it's like, um, um, what's that again? Like, how's that? Uh, so I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody being willing to do that. Yeah, River. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm River Strong and my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I just wanna say how great it is to be here and see everybody and to be having this conversation. It's just stories, stories make the world, right? And so just hearing these stories um, really is, it, it's inspiring and, and yeah, I can see how it's gonna, it's just starting to chart our direction. So really great to hear from everybody. Thanks for sharing. I live in Amherst, in North Amherst, kind of by Popper's Pond in a co-housing community. And there's about 100 people here. There's about 30 units. And it's kind of arranged like condos. People own their own units. And then there's some renters who also live in the community. And until recently, within the last um, few months, I heated with propane, um, which were the original systems when this, this community was built about 25 years ago. And um, where propane systems were put in for all the units. Um, but the community was also built with environmental values in mind. For example, the um, the roof lines were all faced with southern, were built with southern facing roof lines, so that the community could accommodate solar when the original people who were here built could um, have the hope of putting solar on when they got some uh, when they built rebuilt their funds from paying for the place. Um, and they were built with six inch walls and, and pretty well insulated for 25 years ago. So they were, they were forward thinking. Um, that said, uh, I had an unfinished attic and decided that really energy efficiency is the, for me, is the first order of business. Uh, somebody told me once, you know, if you're losing money out of a hole in your pocket, you don't go out and get another job to keep it filled. You just get a needle and thread. Um, and that always sounded sound to me. So I really, um, personally and professionally, I work at UMass with Duane and the Clean Energy Extension, um, really preach energy efficiency because it's uh, almost always the most cost efficient and impactful uh, thing to do uh, if you're losing energy. 
So I'll, I'll kind of constantly be coming back to that. Um, but then yes, definitely renewables after efficiency or in parallel with efficiency. Um, oh, I forgot to say who controls the heat here. So I'd like to think it's me, but it's actually my two teenage kids. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's, that's a point of negotiation. Um, so I got what's called a heat loan, which is a state program um, that provides uh, low or 0% financing for energy efficiency projects. And um, it might be, I can't remember if it's income eligible, but, uh, and it's zero, a 0% loan to, to, uh, to refinish my attic and to do the insulation part of that, to kind of tighten the house. And then to take the next step, my goal was to get off fossil fuels altogether, to get, just get off propane. And the next step was I found a program through um, an organization called Fred Center for Eco Technology, based in Northampton. And they had something called Solar Access, which is an income eligible program. And it, it bundles together solar photovoltaics, so solar panels for electricity with heat pumps, um, air source heat pumps. And it bundles those two things together and, um, and the financing to go with it, uh, which is done through UMass 5 um, Credit Union. And pulls it all together as a package, um, the goal of which is to uh, what's called cash flow cash flow positive. So in other words, the, the payment, so it's a, it's a loan and the payment on the loan is less than or equal to the amount that you, you were paying for the, uh, for your electricity <clears throat> and heat from those two sources. So the idea is that you, you actually make money because you're paying less to the bank than you were paying to the utilities for those things. By participating in that program, so that's something that I would I don't I don't actually know if it's still running, but something that I would recommend that people check out. Um, it's been really good, and uh, it was very complicated. Even with uh, CET holding my hand, there were a lot of meetings and forms and bank meetings and um, and time off of work to kind of project manage the whole thing. Uh, and it, it took the better part of a year to make it all happen. Um, but it, it did happen and everything's up and running and I have solar on my roof and my air, my air source heat pumps are running and I have a pretty tight attic. And we'll see if um, over the course of a year, if I actually use um, uh, what's called net zero. Uh, if, I, if I zero out my, my energy bill, make enough of my own uh, power to provide my own heat. And the air source heat pumps do have cooling capacity, but I haven't used it yet because um, I'm uh, a New Englander and grew up without air conditioning. And so I kind of refuse to turn on the air conditioners again against my kids' wishes. So um, that's the situation. I feel really blessed. And there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of people here who are pursuing a similar path in this community. And um, I've been inspired by many and, and Many, many folks have held my hand and kind of showed me the way. Uh, but it's been really great and I would love to um, talk more about it when, when anybody would like. So thanks a lot, that's me. Thanks, Faber. While we pause on that one, I just wanna um, have somebody in the group think about giving us a very brief definition of fossil fuels. A few people have used that term so far. And it'd be helpful to explain what that means. So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, my lay definition, as I understand it, of fossil fuels are um, fuels that are derived from fossils uh, or uh, formerly plants. Often people say dead dinosaurs, but it's usually not that. It's it's um, it's accumulated plant life that has fallen to the ground, like leaves fall in the woods, but then um, over over millions of years compressed under high pressure, and um, made chemically potent, and um, 
and stores a lot of uh, carbon dioxide because as plants grow, that's food for them. So they're storing a lot of that and then that falls onto the ground and then it gets compressed over time. And there are pockets of dead plants um, all around the world that with enough heat and pressure become uh, either coal or gas, uh, uh, oil, crude oil that's pumped out of the ground or um, natural gas. This is another, another form of fossil fuel. Um, and these are refined into different things like gasoline, like oils, oils, gasoline's derived from, from uh, oil. Uh, and the, they're really, they're amazing energy sources uh, in that they store a lot of, uh, of uh, energy content. And that's why when you, you know, put a match to some gasoline, it goes up in flames and it works really well in cars and it works well for heat and does a lot of amazing things. It's really a miracle substance, these fossil fuels, and they also hold a lot of carbon dioxide. So when they're burned, like we're burning them in a lot of our homes and a lot of our vehicles, they release carbon dioxide. So that's the challenge is we didn't realize until relatively recently that, that all that carbon dioxide that we're taking out of the ground and then putting into the air is serving as a blanket and, and uh, storing, storing the sun's heat and, and heating us up. But fossil fuels are um, burning these, these um, old, very old plants. Okay, and I'm gonna give an even briefer one because that was a lot of very interesting information, <laughs> but basically if you put gas into your car or if you have um, like the fuel tank in your basement, that um, is how your heat works, or if you have um, a, a plug into the wall electric uh, air conditioner or uh, heater, then coal or some type of gas-like substance is being burned to make that power. Am I right on that? Okay, so when we hear people say, I want to avoid fossil fuels, they mean they don't want to use one of those sort of regular put your plug into the wall type situation or gas in your car. And it gets confusing to me because when, you, when I hear people say, we want to electrify everything, I think, oh, I already have all electric. But it's a, it's a different system when they're talking about electric cars, right? And, um, and uh, so I just want to keep sort of uh, reminding people that there's, there's a lot going on here and we'll slowly wrap our heads around it, but we're not going to get too much into more technical now because I want to let everybody finish up sharing. Although it might be good just to mention the different kinds of electric heat, there's some that are much more efficient than others. And the electric resistance heat, that's the cheapest kind of heating system that's put into a lot of low income housing, isn't very efficient. And the heat pump that River was just talking about is very efficient. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, room for conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I just also clarify, if I might, um, Ghazi Jaya, is that um, when you get electricity from the from your, plugging something into the wall, one really doesn't know where that and what made that electricity. That electricity is being made somewhere else and being distributed to your home through the distribution lines that we see all over the place. Um, and so um, uh, it, it, it largely comes from fossil fuels, from power plants, but in this transition to renewables, that's where more and more of that electricity for the grid, um, it, it, obviously if you have it on your home, you can use it pretty much directly, but if it's um, uh, uh, solar in these community solar uh, projects um, or elsewhere or offshore wind, that's putting renewable electricity, non-fossil fuel burning, electricity into the transmission distribution line so it can get to your home. Great, thanks everybody. Cedric, anything you wanna say at this point? You've been thinking and listening. We'll save it, feel free to jump in whenever you're ready. And I think also we haven't heard from 
Don and Lauren and Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Don, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I guess I don't know how to begin. Um, name and pronouns. Yeah, my name is Don Allison, and I go by he, his, and him. Um, yeah, I live in South Amherst, um, and we have a solar array. It's actually on a track um, that produces more electricity than we use um, in our home. We, since we put it in, we've never had an electric bill. We're fortunate that way. Um, I have an electric car. Um, and uh, my wife, we also have a, um, a gasoline, an internal combustion engine car. Um, but since COVID, we haven't used it since one car has been sufficient for my wife and me. Um, all four of our kids are grown. We probably live in a house that's bigger than it needs to be. Um, we are, our, the primary heat is propane, um, although we have been discussing um, heat pumps or even something larger like geothermal um, for our house. Uh, it's a little difficult to talk about this because we have the luxury of being able to afford um, these things. Um, and I think a bigger problem isn't for those of us that can afford it, but how to create um, a system that will provide um, non-fossil fuel energy to the whole community. Um, so it's a little bit difficult for me to talk about it since we can do these things. Um, if we put in heat pumps or geothermal, we could put another, we have enough land so we could put another um, tracking system on our property um, and produce even more electricity. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm acutely aware of, um, Issues. I spent eight years at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm acutely aware of um, the inequalities in our justice system and inequalities all over. I'm on the board of Brookfield Farm, so we're members of that biodynamic farm. All of my kids went to the Waldorf School and were very much tied into that anthroposophical biodynamic community. Um, and I'm also on the board at Double Edge Theater in Ashfield, which is doing a lot of work now on, depending upon which person I hear talk, um, indigenous. And thank you, Stephanie, for that opening blessing. Um, so it's something that's really important to my wife and to myself. I feel like I've been a little bit dragged into it by my wife, and I think Andrew knows that. Um, so she can smile and, and say that. Um, but we're both very committed now. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we find solutions for people who will, of the rental community in Amherst and in, in the whole country. That's pretty much all I have to say. Thanks, Don Don. Let's, let's hold for a sec. Is he okay? You want to say something? Yeah, in this pause, I just really want to um, appreciate and respect you, Don, for acknowledging the discomfort that comes when we are faced with the reality of inequity. Um, and that part of what this meeting is about is about getting you in touch with that discomfort, getting all of us in touch with that discomfort in a way where we're actually faced with talking to each other about it. 
across class, across race, across languages, um, because those of us, I'll just speak for myself, uh, I also have that knot in my stomach. I have a mix of anger and um, shame and desire <laughs> um, all mixed in. And, um, you know, when I hear someone say, you know, maybe that they feel blessed or fortunate or any of those words, uh, I also feel um, concerned that we are conveying that this reality about who has ownership of their land or of their power or of their choices um, is related to some sort of uh, system based on goodness when the reality is that it's a system based on racism and uh, class discrimination. And um, those are things that this committee uh, has been open to exploring. Um, some of you may have heard the term environmental justice and it's uh, an effort to bring to the forefront that we're not just talking about pollution and fossil fuels, that we're also talking about the systems um, that have created the need to have these conversations. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I respect you for acknowledging that feeling and I encourage all of us to, to not pull away from that feeling while we're here together to, to take the opportunity to sit with it and to really notice that um, what's coming up a lot is ownership um, and how land ownership impacts our abilities to make decisions um, and how we either, because we own land, we have all sorts of um, financial breaks and when we don't own land, we are spending more than those who um, actually do have the financial privilege. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lauren De La Parra. I um, use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, I currently live in Boston, um, so I rent. <laughs> um, and I think we felt lucky in the sense, so we live in a very small apartment. I think we're, we have 450 square feet. And so heating and cooling is not very expensive. Um, we're also in a middle unit, so there, you know, we're on the second floor. Um, and we've always been interested in um, procuring renewable energy, but there, I think there's a lot of confusing marketing out there and we never have actually um, made that leap. Um, we used to live in Somerville and there um, they have a municipal aggregation program as well. And so we were, um, we opted up to the 100% renewable rate um, for a time there. Um, but now that we're in Boston, we don't do that. Um, we have taken advantage of mass save incentives in the past. So my husband has gotten us, you know, a nice fancy programmable um, thermostat that helps us keep our uh, energy slow when we're out um, of the house, which obviously um, we're not using as much these days uh, since we're pretty much home all the time. But, um, but it has been really nice in the past um, to, to be able to set that on automatic. Um, and we, we do things like, you know, putting weather uh, in, insulation on our windows and weather stripping our doors and things like that. But um, I think that's sort of the theme it's the, that there's just, there's only so much you can do when you're a renter. Um, I think I actually, um, so I went to UMass for 
in grad school and I took a course with Duane and um, wrote a paper about the, the split incentive problem, um, which is sort of the technical term that I won't use again, <laughs> um, uh, that, that speaks to this, this conflict that's created when, um, when renters are paying the electricity bill, but landlords have the control over the decisions being made about upgrades and maintenance. And, um, and it's, it's really a tough problem to solve. And I think there are some things that we can, um, we can advocate for when it comes to, yeah, things like property management um, companies, for sure. I think one of the barriers that we face in our current location is that um, there are seven units in our building and seven different condo associations. <laughs> um, so, so finding ways to coordinate um, at the smaller scale, like, like with Rivers um, co-housing community or um, with the community solar, I think are, are just like really exciting and promising practices. I feel like I didn't answer the original question. So I'll just say um, our place is heated with natural gas. Um, and I think for it to be better, I mean, yeah, we would have the option to opt up to 100% renewable um, on our, our electricity bill. Um, and we would be able to maybe have a more structured way of working with our landlord to um, push forward those types of upgrades in a way that's mutually beneficial. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm gonna ask Cedric one more time if you wanna say something as, which is wait a sec, give it a moment. Bye guys. Hey, 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 every, hey, everyone. Hi, we, how are we doing? Sorry. Uh, kids. Um, <laughs> I got kids. Um, for me, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, on this side of, I live on a small, I live in a small apartment also. Uh, I'm in Amherst. I go by Cedric. Uh, he, him, his, I, uh, in the area I live in, I just, I'm just going to tell y'all my story is I, I recently, my, my room has been a scorcher, like you guys say in mass, a scorcher. Um, <laughs> and it's been, the heat has risen, um, and I have carpet in the room, so it was pretty hot. Uh, last those last couple weeks where it hit like 90 95 and things like that so I have to figure a way out with my heating um, and I have I think uh, like those electric heats on the ground so I don't know what that type is is that um, I have the electric heat <laughs> on the ground and uh, and I mean I, I I was just standing there and I was sweating like a, a wet dog, you know, a wet dog's tongue, you know, just sweating, just all over. So I went on YouTube and I said, all right, what can I do to like get this heat out of my room? Uh, open the window and then I just put an electric fan and faced it the other way. And I have two windows and it just goes in one, one in, out the other. So the heat just, you know, gets out my room. Uh, and then when I come back to my room, so I basically uh, train in the afternoons. Uh, and so when I, I leave the room, I take the heat out. And then when I come back, I kind of bring in the cool air. And then once the cool air comes in, I close that bad boy up at night. <laughs> and then that basically is my little cooling system during the day. The shades are closed. And uh, that's... That's it. There's no AC unit. I mean, the fan. I turn the fan off as much as I can. I don't necessarily. Uh, I don't tell anybody, but I don't pay the electric because it, it's all inclusive. So I don't, you know. So, but I try not to abuse it still because I don't know where it's going from. Um, during the heat, uh, during the winter time, though, 
I really don't control the heat at all. There's no control. It's the building. So I don't know who actually, it's the company or the whoever the owners are of the uh, building. They control the heat. And and uh, so it's it's it turns on and off sporadically during the winter time. And that's it. I just try to, you know, keep it cool in the summer and, and uh, you know, stay warm in the winter. Just trying to survive. I survived, you know, and that's, that's my story right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, this is like, this is a rough summer. This is a very Yeah, rough and it's not raining either, so <laughs> it's pretty, it gets pretty hot because we need the rain. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cedric. I'll just uh, mention, I don't know if it's the case with yours, but I've lived in a couple places where you can't even put a AC unit in the window because they're weird windows. Is that the case with yours? Oh, no, I see. Uh, one of my neighbors has an AC unit. Uh, so uh, it's not, you know, I just didn't get it. Yeah, which they're like hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> is the other issue. Yeah. It, I'll just share a really quick story because there are so many places around that don't have windows that will allow for one or who don't provide an AC unit. When I was pregnant, I lived at um, Pomeroy Lane and you can't have a unit in there. And it was so hot and I was so pregnant. My kid was born September 2nd. So I was like major at the end of August. And I ended up Googling desperate, similar to you, Cedric, in the middle of the night one night when I was just sweating with this That's right. child. And um, I Googled, what do pregnant women in India do? <laughs> so I was like, that's got to be the hottest place I can imagine. And I found out that this is what they do, or not pregnant women in particular, but everyone wets their sheets and then puts it on them wet and actually the evaporation like cools you and it magically works so now i you know galileo has grown up thinking my eight-year-old that like everybody just like goes to bed with a wet sheet in the, in the summer <laughs> because that's our our cooling system <laughs> yeah i put a wet towel over my fan so there you go my fan and then that cools it down as well. Or nice. wet over your head, something like that, during the time to cool down. Nice. So I'm, I, I'm in that club with you. Yes. Right. I need you to come help us do a fan system. Yeah, the wet towel club. Hey, just YouTube. I, I, YouTube has everything, folks. Uh, <laughs> YouTube. And now it I have all, solve the, all our problems. All the, I have a, a climate action group to go to now. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank Welcome. you, Cedric. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, and so I'm going to just hold for a sec. I just want to offer there's some great YouTube videos on how to make an air conditioner with ice that you just put in. Seems pretty cool. Nice. So I'd love to, we, there's some themes that are coming up and that we're starting to feel. I think Don talked a little bit and Kazikaya has talked a little about some of the themes. Um, and I'd like to just for us to try and highlight some of those themes. Um, uh, as we go through the process of creating a plan, uh, there's so many different things to do um, that'd be valuable, I think for us to kind of set some, like, okay, these are what we're trying to work on when we're doing all these different things. And we've kind of, we've kind of identified a few things. There's some, something about, uh, um, you know, reducing fossil fuels. There's something about working in ways that don't, uh, that don't uh, advantage landowners and don't advantage uh, people without means to support uh, certain activities. 
I'd, I'd like to sort of get some sense of where we might take that. Like, what are you hearing? What do you think about what, what are the, I, I use the word principles, but it's like, what, what are the, like, what is it we're aiming for here when we're trying to do some of these things? Yeah, Jake. I just want to quick mention, Stephanie did not get a chance to share on the first question, so. I'm, I'm fine with moving on just in the interest of time. Okay. It's okay. So I think one of those themes, um, or what you were getting to was community access, fair community access. Um, and getting pretty technical or, or uh, I'll limit it, I'll try. Um, Community Solar uh, is sort of an initiative to get um, projects going and the state is incentivizing um, uh, all um, backgrounds uh, to community access through the um, SMART program, which is something that is maybe for a second conversation, um, but that's the current incentive program in Massachusetts. So there are fair community um, access uh, adders is what they're called. So there's the standard incentive and then there's actually adders on top of that. So um, a company like a Nexamp would be an aggregator for multiple tenants or um, multiple communities to develop a large project and then have um, multiple off takers. So that was pretty technical. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna push you, all right? So, great, bunch of technical things. We can do this, we can do this, we can do this. What's the goal? The you goal- about five words. 100% renewable energy. Okay. Stephanie, you have something you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, you know, one of the themes that I heard too was also, um, you know, um, housing that isn't well insulated. Um, and so building envelopes that are inadequate are, you know, make all the difference. And so I feel like there needs to be a way to address, um, that needs to address, uh, you know, the existing housing stock because people are living there. And I think of someone like you know, Jen, who owns her place and yet can't do anything about the building envelope, which just, you know, is just wrong. <laughs> you know, and I just feel like there should be some ways to address that somehow. Um, and I know that's really super challenging. I know I'm saying that like it's, you know, just a thing you can do. And it's, it's not an easy thing you can do. But somehow I wonder, um, it seems like a lot of the, the incentives often exist for, you know, individual homeowners but what about complexes? Like I don't see a lot of incentives for complexes and really that's where there's a lot of need. So it seems like there should be a way to address that. That's one thing. Um, and then I lost track of what my second thing was, but that's a pretty why don't you big hold one on thing. To, why don't you hold on to that on your second thing? Let's give it a sec and then River. Uh, I guess what's coming up for me in this conversation is, um, you know, Don touched on it and I guess he kind of, um, uh, uh, the disparity between resources and access to, um, that we're, we're talking specifically about clean energy here, but um, we could probably broaden it out, but we'll keep it to that. So I think to try to address your question, Jim, it's something about equitable access not necessarily equal and, and the image that comes to mind I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with it but there's a an illustration of three kids who are trying to watch a baseball game from behind a fence and one's one's short and one's kind of medium and one's tall and um, and the tall one can already see over the fence and and the medium one um, can just barely and the short one can't and uh, in one instance you can create equality by giving them each a, a box to stand on. Um, and, and that feels right, like everybody should, should be equal. Um, but then you actually, the illustration shows them standing on the box and the, and the short one still can't see over the fence and the, the medium one can and the tall one also can, but could before anyway. 
Um, so the question of equity is that they each get the box that they need. So the short one gets two boxes and the medium one maybe gets one and, then, and the tall one doesn't actually need a box. So there's something in that. It's such a simple, um, beautiful illustration of equity versus equality. And so I'm thinking if there could be some kind of needs assessment around ac access to clean energy, um, whether and you know, with a, with a bunch of different criteria related to okay, do you rent or do you own? Um, uh, there would undoubtedly be some income or some kind of wealth um, indicator, but to try to understand the needs of each of the individuals in the community, uh, and there may be a hundred problems that I'm not anticipating with that, but it would be interesting to understand how um, the 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 access profile or something um, around uh, people's ability to access clean energy and, and renewable energy. Thanks, River. During this next pause, I just want to um, make sure we're leaving space for Jen and Cedric and Alini because we can't see your hands. So I'm gonna ask us to take in a little bit of an extra pause here in case one of you wants to um, join. Great, Alini. All right, um, so I think one of the things that would be great, I definitely because I'm a renter, um, you know, being the process of buying a house for a long time, but it is hard um, for some of us. So, but I've been renting, I want to say, since I was, what, 18? So, I can I don't know. I forgot how old I am. <laughs> um, for a long time. And I feel like we don't have a lot of rights as renters. Um, everything is very hard. We have to comply with whatever they tell us to do. And I think it's especially hard to rent in a condominium where not only do I have to go by what my landlord has to say, but also comply with the property managers. It's like two different steps that I need to take every time I, I want to do some sort of improvement um, to where I'm renting. Um, so definitely I think um, renters right will be something that would be great for us to work on and um, accessibility because like I do want to be able to have um, economy saving, um, light saving um, features in my house, but I cannot afford that. So either I have to go get it myself or beg my landlord who won't do it. So it's, you know, kind of that situation. Like if things were more affordable, then I'll be like, well, forget you. I'm going to do it because I am the one that's paying at the end of the month. Um, but when it's everything else is so much more expensive, it makes it even harder for us to have to do that. So that's kind of my two cents on that. Thanks, Eleni. That, that, is, that was a beautiful uh, statement of, uh, of sort of what River was sort of trying to get at. Uh, you made it very clear. Uh, um, Jen or Cedric, uh, you got something you want to say? I sorry, I was losing, every, losing the connection with the video. So hopefully, yeah, and feel free to turn it off uh, and still speak. <laughs> um, oh, and I, I didn't include my pronouns. She, her, hers. Um, no, I think that you know, along with what we're talking about with access and equity. I mean, in you know, Stephanie said it. Just like you know, in the, how do we make it? Um, possible for people living in the complexes to participate in any of this and um, because uh, you know you feel just like powerless basically to participate you know there's just like all these opportunities for you know yeah homeowners essentially and so yeah and I think for things to really shift it's going to be you know business owners or like property managers, you know, um, it's, you know, it's like, it's capitalism. <laughs> it's like, what's it gonna, I mean, right now, it's just, you know, like, the, like goodwill, you know, like, oh, we're gonna take 
we're gonna let, like our bottom line is gonna take a hit so we can do this good thing. But I, I just feel like there has to be policy or to incentivize um, business owners to make these changes and that um, the good, you know, it's like, this is good for everyone. This is good. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's like for the planet, for all living beings and animate and non animate beings like forever. And that like, yeah, I mean, we know capitalism doesn't like fit the model of, you know, sort of ecological wellness and uh, yeah. So that's where it always sort of comes to for me. Okay. Um, can I ask you a little bit more there, sure. Jen? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we haven't said right now is that one of our aims is to, uh, is to, help be to help beings other than humans as well. Is, is that what you're saying? I'm saying- and Would you like to say it more strongly? I would say, I mean, it's all like, it's all one. Like we can't set really separate ourselves from the natural world. And, um, you know, we've created this system that's worked for a while, but it's not gonna work forever. I think we all know that. Like the bottom line is not, you know, it's just like there's a limit to growth and like we can't keep doing it this way. So like, what's it gonna take? And you know, it's, it takes an emergency or, you know, we're sort of in an emergency. and. Anyway, I, you know, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but yeah, like what policy changes have to happen to shift, you know, the minds and hearts of like, I don't know, it's not just minds and hearts. I mean, people can have their minds and hearts in like, you know, uh, the, you know the right place, but it's, it's really about um, the system shifting so that like, you know, whatever has to happen so that the landowners, the property managers, business owners can um make you know whatever make the money they need to make and also um do right by like for the good of you know everyone and i you know i don't it's not the planet it's well it is it's it's us i mean the planet's gonna be fine like once we're all you know, like, you know after Aww. i mean i don't want to be pessimistic but you you get what i'm saying i just i, I don't know i think it, it always just comes down to like that that shift as far as like the equity piece and um, the access piece, so, yeah. Um, I'm gonna let Stephanie talk. She has been very patient. I, well, I didn't say much earlier about, you know, um, where I live and how I feel in my house and all that, but I did wanna say, I. so I came to home ownership very late in life. And so I was a renter for, from um, well, when I was really young, my parents uh, rented and we lived in East Boston and um, it was a very small apartment and we had very little control over anything in our house. Um, and um, my sister slept on a couch in our living room until she was 17. And um, so it was a very small place. And I remember it always in the summertime being excruciatingly hot and, you know, we had fans and open the windows but there was not a lot you could do um, especially in the city it was just brutal um, and then from 18 till about 45 I was a renter as an adult in my adult years and um, so I even as a homeowner now you know we own our home and we heat with oil <laughs> because um, we couldn't afford to just revamp everything you know we're we're sort of piecemealing it as we can as we go along but we couldn't just afford to um to just change things over so um even though i do the work that i do <laughs> i heat my home with oil right now um so i just wanted to say that and um but then i wanted to say that um you know when i look at these themes and i look at you know, um, the use of natural resources. I, I agree with Jen on some level um, that it really takes kind of an emergency to really get action because the way systems are set up, things will just continue. And I think that's part of why we're trying to do this in a different way is because to affect change, you have to 
change. <laughs> you have to change things up. So, um, you know, the ways that we're having this conversation about talking, you know, that we're starting to talk a little bit about policy too, and these types of things are really important. And um, I know that was a little bit all over the map, but it's just kind of where my head is because everybody said so many really great things uh, that got me thinking. And so my, my thought process is, you know, sort of in a million different directions. So um, that's, that's really all. I don't know that that was very helpful, but uh, that's just what I was thinking. I wanted to bring up something that hasn't come up tonight, um, which is health. Uh, one person mentioned like soot being in their lungs. Um, my eight year old has allergies to dust and mold and we have carpet and, you know, uh, like Alini said, these ancient air conditioners and heaters and fans and um, Galileo just has like so much congestion um, every night. and. I really feel like it impacts Galileo's sleep, and I know that breathing impacts like heart regulation and all these different things. And now Galileo's taking medicine every day. And I know so many families that really suffer um, because of the way the complexes don't care about the mold or the dust or the carpet or whatever with their kids with asthma. Um, our neighbors, both the mom and the middle kid have like asthma that ends them up in the hospital um, at least a couple times a year because of the way that the dust and the mold um, intertwine in their unit. And, and that's something that I hear from people in all the complexes. Yeah, Andrea. So um, I, I really appreciate the um, themes that people are bringing up. I feel like um, I'd really like for uh, an, an emphasis on landlords. I think that, you know, 40% are renters and we have um, the possibility of really being, coming up with some creative solutions for how to <clears throat> make healthy homes out of our, you know, the apartment and condominium, condominiums um, in Amherst that will affect a lot of people. Um, so that, that's a priority for me to really focus on multifamily possibilities. And, um, Lynn knows I, um, she and I both know well the difficulties with mass save and, um, it's not a solution to a lot of these problems. It, it, it does not do the deep work. Um, it's really low hanging fruit that, that they'll, they'll do. And, you know, my condominium <laughs> also is massive would not pay for the amount of insulation that they could add to it um, because it doesn't meet their criteria for how much of a difference it would make. Um, so yeah, I think that it's one of the things I'd like to do with the community choice aggregation is um, have opportunities for incentives for both homeowners and um, landlords to fix things for um, that wouldn't be paid for by other programs. Thanks, Sandra. And that experience is, thank you for sharing that experience as well. Um, it is 7.20.
uh, it's probably time for us to sort of wrap this up. Um, Alini, Cedric. Uh, uh, I think Jen lost service like, for a minute. Like Jen had to run, yeah. But she might um, be back on. Uh, anything you want, you would like to sort of say to, to wrap up this before we sort of close the, the conversation and do a little bit of closing? Jen's back. Go for it, Tater. Hey, uh, no, I'm just, I'm all set. I'm just listening and uh, really just want to hear, hear what people have to say. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Then we're just, uh, oh, Alini, go ahead. And I was just going to um, say the same thing, that it was a lot of information. Um, a lot of things to kind of take in and process and be aware that we, that I normally don't think about. Um, so this was a lot of great information and takeaways. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, uh, Jen, anything you sort of want to share out of that conversation you think is important to land on? Yeah, sorry, I, I actually lost connection and I had to come back on my phone. So um, I unfortunately I missed a piece, um, but um, I, I'm just grateful to be part of this and looking forward to, you know, kind of seeing what what can come of it, you know, like what we can do to, you know, actually move the needle on some of the bigger, um, you know, barriers to, to access and participation, um, to everybody's participation in, you know, clean, you know, accessing um, renewables and clean energy. So, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Jen. And um, I just want to reiterate uh, Gazikaya's comment uh, earlier that if there are things you want to say, if there are things you want to try and understand better, if they're for everybody. And if there are things you think, wow, I've been listening to this conversation, it's finally sunk in, it's like, I need to say this. Uh, um, reach out to Stephanie, reach out to Kazikaya, reach out to Dwayne and Andra uh, and uh, say and ask um, by all means. Uh, and the other thing is that we, have, we will have two more meetings uh, that, are, that we're scheduled to have. The meetings are not scheduled. Uh, it'll be probably, we'll probably try and schedule it around the end of the month uh, to give us time to put all the notes together and make sure everybody has time to ask the things. And we talked about putting together a video about the community choice aggregation. It's like, okay, some things we got to do before we get to the next thing. Um, want to give ourselves time and not uh, get out of control. Um, and then uh, the sort of the final thought is that um, we uh, the there's sort of there's a team that has put this this meeting together, and that team is uh, Dwayne and Andra and Stephanie and uh, um, Lauren and Gazit Kaya and then myself um, uh, and um, and thinking about sort of what do we, where do we, how do we start the next meeting? We thought that it might be great to ask a question for you to take home and ask some of your friends and then bring back that information. Uh, and so we've sort of, we had a couple of questions that we were toying with, but I'm going to let, I'm going to put Lauren on the spot and uh, let her sort of asked the question. We had originally thought about asking a question about heating and cooling, and we've kind of kind of done that, I think, pretty well. So I, I think we're gonna head us, we're suggesting heading a slightly different direction. Uh, Lauren? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and Gazikaya, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but given the great conversation this evening around um, what I called earlier the split incentive problem, but around sort of this tension between renters' rights and, and landlords and the role of property managers and business companies, uh, business managers. Um, we were thinking um, of asking folks to 
ask your neighbors or your friends um, sort of what uh, barriers they've faced as tenants in the past or um, if they know of folks who have and um, what would really be important to think about when it comes to um, to, to resolving that issue, to um, strengthening rent, renters' rights, to um, working with landlords. If you are a landlord yourself, then um, thinking about sort of how you come to that angle. Um, or if you know folks who are landlords, how they think about that issue. Um, so, so yeah, if, if um, folks want to reflect on the, the renter-landlord relationship and their experience with that, um, and, and how that might be improved to expand access and um, access to clean energy. Awesome, thank you, uh, Lauren, nicely put. So we're gonna ask you to do that uh, kind of as homework for the committee, uh, for the task group, uh, to, to ask a few folks what they think. What do you think? Um, and then um, we'll gather that back up uh, uh, Gazit Kai will reach out to everybody about gathering that information back up uh, and so that we have a way to share uh, at the beginning of the next meeting. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I kind of pushed Duane and Andra out of the way in setting up that question. And um, I'd like to offer you the, uh, the last word. My last word would be just um, appreciate that question. I think it's a, it's a good question to pose and I'm all in favor of moving forward in that direction. But my last word is really just appreciation for um, uh, listening and learning from everybody today. Um, I think that was my main job other than my um, seven minutes of uh, maybe too cumbersome uh, language, uh, but nonetheless um, really um, learned a lot, uh, took in a lot, um, that'll be really important for the committee um, and look forward to their next next session and the, and the one after that. So, and thanks Jim and, and, and uh, team for um, facilitating such a good discussion. Yeah, I really want to appreciate the um, focus on stories. I think that that both helps us to know, you know, who's in the room, um, but also it uh, gives us the the ability to be very concrete in whatever solutions we come up with. Um, so I, I like the idea of coming back with some stories. Thank you, everybody. I am um, really interested actually in having one-to-one -one conversations with people. So um, if you, but, you know, are open to that, please, you know, let whoever your contact is, Kazit Haya or Stephanie, know, because um, I, I think it would be really rich to pull more um, stories out of people with, with more time. We don't have a lot, just two hour meetings. Absolutely. And I want to offer to everyone that there are 15 community leaders who are working with this project total, and they're all as incredible as Jen, Cedric, and Alini. And um, we have uh, a lot of resources and information to share. So anyone who wants to have more opportunity to talk with myself or one of the other community leaders, you can also ask Stephanie um, about that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Anything else? I just want to thank everybody, myself too, and say that this was really fantastic. This is the second of our task group meetings and they've both been just really wonderful. And thank you everybody for sharing so much and so honestly. Indeed. So great to meet some of you that we didn't know before. Nice to see old faces. Indeed. Uh, awesome. So we'll see you all in uh, three weeks or so. Great. Great to meet everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye.